Well, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. It's a beautiful building to talk in. And um, so um, I've got lots of images, and I, will, and I hope that they speak words that we can all understand. Um, beneath our feet is a network. It's an extraordinary network uh, of great complexity and vastness interconnected and intelligent, and some people call this the wood wide web. Within a medium alive with more microorganisms than people on this earth, just within one handful, soil is precious. It's a supporting system which I like to call critical infrastructure, not bridges, not roads, not sewage pipes, soil which is biodiverse, walk in this wood, experience the light, smells, and you know you feel better. This is ideal to me. This is not. This is intensive agriculture. To me, I look at this and I see soil degradation and soil loss. In fact, um, we probably have only 60 harvests left in our soil unless we change tack quickly. And we recognize and reconnect and restore um, and understand by feeling, by touching, by experiencing. This is my social enterprise, this is my soil scientist Tim O'Hare, and here we are in the field, not in a lecture hall, but out there, absolutely experiencing what the landscape means. And most of the soils in our cities are anthropogenic which describe human activity, whereas natural profiles are complex, beautifully uh, rep representing geological time. And this is from a, an amazing map and book created in the United States, which was mapping all the soils of the states in 1936, and they engaged a fine artist to, to draw those soil profiles for that mapping. And the top surface of this is the skin. It's the skin of the earth. It's a dynamic medium, which can easily be abused through compaction and contamination. And when we're on site, the auger tells it all. It tells the whole story. In this case, me and our soil scientist were augering down where the contractor says he's finished to see what lies below. And what lies below here is waterlogging. You don't need to go and dig it up. You can smell it. It's a visceral experience from which we can gain so much understanding alongside, of course, the policy, the strategy, which are beginning in London in particular to recognize inherently what we know to be important deep down. So you see, I have a passion for soil, but I also have a passion for urban forestry. Um, and I just want to take you through, briefly touch on three um, projects as well, which underpin, um, and, and a philosophy which underpins our work. The urban forest, um, I mean, what would London be without its trees? In fact, the whole notion of resilience and sustainability originates from the 17th century, from 1662, when John Evelyn talked to the Royal Institute about a resource that underpinned the economy. And today, we see it in terms of well-being, but it's, it was then, in the 17th century, to do with the economy. But urban forestry is also about biodiversity. It's about um, climate change adaptation, where um, catchment-based approach and canopy cover are interlinked. And that's the basin of the River Thames, and that's, the river, and that's, uh, that's London there on the right where the urban forest holds open the soils, intercepts, attenuates, mitigating surface water flooding. Please note, there's hardly a tree in sight there. That's in Croydon in London last year. This is the reality. The challenge is in an impervious city. And I'm part of this action group, it's cross-disciplinary, engineers, arboriculturalists, landscape architects, architects, planners. Um, and we 
advocate for urban forestry, um, which is a uniquely dynamic resource, <clears throat> whether that's self-seeded on a brownfield site or whether it's ancient and managed over millennia. Natural, yes, but bearing the hallmarks of mankind's intervention. These are, this is Epping Forest in the centre of London, and those are what's called coppards. So it's halfway between coppicing and pollarding. And it's been done, those, those uh, stool, stools are something like 200 years old. So it's a management, it looks natural, but we've been there and we've been interfacing with natural processing, processes and interrupting that. So there's an artist who I admire called Richard Wentworth who calls much of London an air of outstanding unnatural beauty. We have these designations of areas of, out, of outstanding natural beauty and he talks about unnatural beauty. And our social enterprise gets experts and enthusiasts of all sorts into the field to experience together. And this is a small nature reserve in the centre of London, very deprived part of London. To experience together what it feels like, nature, deep ecology, deep experience, deep that breeds deep commitment and a deep connection. And I'm in love with this man. Unfortunately, he died in 2009. But Arnie Nice was a Norwegian philosopher who was inspired himself by Rachel Carson, um, who wrote The Silent Spring. Um, and the deep ecology movement came, was named by him. My other hero is Ian McCarg, and I am my professor at university was taught by Ian McCarg. Um, and you know, it's quite galling that his Design with Nature, that was such a critical publication, a critical piece of thinking, is now 50 years old. And yet, have we moved on? <laughs> have we, you know, we've, we've lost half a century. Um, and it recognised, um, because we need to recognise where the disruptions are that we are creating in natural systems in order that we can create a new vision. And, and inspired by a, leaf, a belief and a philosophy that is holistic and equal and interwoven, um, not about egos, about us all. We're all animals. We're all part of the system. And we only have one system. And it's beautiful. And its beauty is captured by the astronauts on Apollo 8 almost exactly 50 years ago. This was the first time anyone had seen the Earth in all its beauty from space. So there is no time for apathy, and we must all take responsibility, and I feel privileged to be a landscape architect. And we all have the tools to make a difference and to inspire. So here are three projects, very briefly. One's cultural, one's commercial, and one's to do with the community. But they're all to do with community, actually. They're all to do with people. So in Oslo, we were great, very, very privileged to have won a competition uh, for the new Munch Museum. And Munch himself had a very torrid relationship with nature that's interesting in its own way. Um, and we were inspired by the biodiversity of the coastal habitats of Norway, which are enormous, enormously long coastal habitat, many, many microclimates. Um, to develop a narrative of na natural and man-made coming together within what is now a very harsh urban environment, which is the new waterfront. It's incredibly lacking in, um, in nature for a community such as the Norwegians who escape to nature all the time and, and appreciate it. Um, and it really was a response to the artist, to Tracy Emin's commission, which is um, called The Mother, um, uh, it's going to be a nine-metre bronze sitting on this artificial island outside the museum in the water. And what we wanted to do was to evolve a landscape for an extraordinary work of art, which was both talked about the vulnerabilities. It's a feminist piece, really, but it talks about those vulnerabilities and those strengths of a pregnant woman kneeling in a meadow looking out to sea. And we were inspired by the geology of the Oslo Fjord, the soils, the flora, um, 
and to create an artificial habitat like these, you know, where the green roofs um, just blend, they just merge, and what is natural and what is artificial, you can hardly tell them apart. Um, and to create a place that is wild but accessible. So there are many demands today when we all design that, in a sense, I feel like if we've designed and people can access a landscape um, and don't know there's been a designer there, then that's, you've done your job well. The next door site to our site here is Noheta's Opera House. And, and uh, I find it rather amusing that their concept was a snowy meadow, but there's not a trace of life here. So we will make the meadow next door, and that will be biodiverse. Um, and um, it will be in a place that you wouldn't expect, right in the middle of the city, and where the pregnant mother will kneel looking out to sea. And we're procuring local provenance seeds for plug planting to, in a sense, achieve, you might say, if you're critical, an illusion of a meadow, but will which, which, which over the long term, this is a meadow we created a year after we seeded it, well, we hope that meadow will become a catalyst for discussion and action to do with natural process in the city. Um, a mini mosaic of self what might seem to be self-seeded, in essence a seed bed, and a resource for urban pollination research with the local university. And the second project is in the centre of London. It was on a contaminated site of ruderal vegetation over anthropogenic, anthropogenic soils, old railway land. Um, nonetheless, interesting to understand what lies below, to understand the history of that site, and how that influenced what might seem to be a sort of scruffy, messy sort of place. And to us, this is full of messages. This is full of value. Um, it is a symbol of uh, resilience. And uh, if you just um, note, uh, where is this pointer? That tree there was due to be um, cut down. And we fought to retain it, because it was almost like a symbol, like development comes and goes. And that was a symbol of continuity. And um, just because it was a low category by the arboriculturalists, they said they were going to remove it. And we said, well, why? Because that would cost you a lot of money to, to plant a tree like that as part of the development. Um, but it's amazing how hard it was to get the local authority and the developer, who was our client, to see, to see its beauty. Um, and the irony is that much of the site needed to be cleared. We retained the tree. And then we self-seeded, uh, then we hydro-seeded a temporary landscape while some sites wait for development, which had the seeds in it of the previous natural meadow. So, but this was a doing action. And the process of doing made it feel like everyone was in control. The reality is, underneath all of this, we need to create the ability for res resilience and the below ground infrastructure in cities is massive nowadays. Um, and we have to work hard to create the openings, to create the breathing spaces at the surface, which are meaningful and which contribute to the quality of life. So this is this, the water attenuation. And these are the trees that we brought in at nine to 12 meters high. Um, and then this is it finished. So that there's some kind of hopefully uh, seemingly effortless um, support of both a high intensity, uh, a, a, an urban space of high intensity use, but with open soils and um, a grove of trees that is going to help to modify what is going to be a very harsh microclimate. Um, and this is the tree there that creates the framing of that space, um, uh, which through ad advocating its retention, it influenced a lot of other developers in the area to do so as well, and to value existing assets. 
And the third project is the Dalston Eastern Curve, which was part of a large project called Making Space in Dalston. And this is a project that grew out of a strategic intention. The, all, the, all, uh, the All London Green Grid was a mayoral strategy to map first all the green infrastructure that then developer, then the local authority could demand of developers that they make green connections, that they talk to the officers across borough boundaries to make the most of connectivity, of biodiversity, of places to grow, of places to be able to live healthy lives. Um, and from seemingly inhospitable and disregarded brownfield ecology of Dalston, um, a project that was as much about a sense of ecological connectivity of plants and people as well as actual ecological value, um, this project sort of emerged from grassroots. That's its location in London. Um, for those of you who know the Olympic Park, uh, the Olympic Park is just here. Sorry, it's just there. Um, we grew this project. Um, we actually wrote the brief, tendered on it, and then luckily won the project because um, there was, uh, we, we felt that the local authority was moving in the wrong direction. Um, and from, um, and grew, we grew it from the community, but also from a collaboration. And most of our work is collaborative between studios. We build teams for specific jobs. And those collaborations are really impo important to keep open-minded. Um, and these are a number of projects that Muff Architecture Art and ourselves have done together. And we build a sort of understanding and a discourse which creates uh, a bit more edginess and a bit, you know, you don't sit back. I've been running my practice for nearly 35 years and it would be easy to get um, a little bit lazy and it gives you a bit of a zhuzh. So compromise is good in my book. Um, and what was delivered was highly personalized um, with myself and Liza and with Nick Henniger from Exist, who is an artist collaboration. And through what we call, it's a very planning term, but it's called deliberative planning. Um, which is non-linear, that's the important thing, a project where we diverted the fury of the local community to what was happening to the proposals of the Greater London Authority. And we fueled that energy, which was, these were their visualizations of everything becoming homogenic, everything becoming the same as everywhere else in London, um, of providing housing that was not accessible to the people who lived in Dalston. And this led, there was so much anger that they had to use riot police in the council chambers to keep the calm. So the Greater London Authority came to us to seek help. And um, we said, you have to stop your process and we have to start from the beginning. And that created this project um, to make reality um, a reality that was meaningful, that didn't do tabula rasa, that didn't just clear away everything and say, aren't you lucky we've given you something new uh, and ignore the community, but rather to listen and respond. So we started right back to the beginning. We started mapping all the existing assets, not just in the public realm, but on the estates as well. And we researched the cultural activity that was already there to evolve a deeply committed approach of first valuing what was there, second you nurture the possible, and only then do you define what's missing. And we created uh, opportunities for multiple feedback loops, listening, responding, listening again. We had meetings within community space, not in meeting rooms, and we hired that space. So some of our fee went to those communities to provide that space for our clients and came up with this idea of a disconnected park because there wasn't space for a, a big park. And anyway, having small spaces that are close to where you live is more useful. And it was pr a practical approach, but it was also strategic, talking about outcomes and outputs in order that we can secure funding. Uh, so we framed the projects that came forward through discussion with the local community. Um, 
and um, we framed them up under specific agendas which we knew would be easy for the local for the Greater London Authority to give money to. So it was a very strategic thing that came out of a very practical um, act. And we were asked to um, put forward 10 projects um, and we, we put forward 10 themes, and under those 10 themes, 75 projects. Those were ones, that's how much energy there was in the local community to tell us what needed to be done. Um, and um, so that emerged rather than being superimposed. One of those projects is this project. Um, it was a discreet, underused, scruffy bit of old la railway land, and we loved it. And we left the hoarding up and we made a little door so that you get that sense of separation between a very busy road and a tiny bit of land, 0.2 of a hectare. Um, and the way we did that was we primed the site. We worked with the Barbican um, and, ident and offered this up to them so that they could uh, um, use it as part of their radical nature exhibition um, in order to show that there were possibilities um, and that were beyond just making um, a community garden. Um, and from here, we work with local youth groups and an artist collective called Exist to create apprenticeships that cultivated skills, ownership and value. Values that we framed up in terms of rural ecology that was, is being lost in London, which is wasteland ecology is now becoming very precious because there's so much development of, of, of every space, where the detritus of yesterday became a place to grow grassroots community cohesion, retaining the self-seeded buddleia. To so many, buddleia means dilapidation. But look at the butterflies. So what's not to like? They're resilient. You don't need to water them. And we planted a small urban forest, um, seemingly natural, uh, with pioneer species that we left untouched. Um, and so that there was still, it was almost that we, when we moved away from the project, it, there was room for the community to, to start working within it, with our, and, and we then collaborated uh, uh, gratis uh, with the, that lo local community. Um, and so there was a design intent, um, but that was as important as what was left undesigned, if you like. So, ideal is perhaps a dangerous word in its meaning, because um, it's different to each of us, and if we're representing communities, then how do we have the audacious capacity to say what's ideal for that community? So we ask questions, and we develop a process, and it's the total ecology of the place, the people, the balance of how it's all managed, the governance structure, and this is us evolving what, what, what groups in the community could come together to look at long-term stewardship of that place. Um, they evolve um, not after the design, but alongside and as part of the design process because landscapes are about people. And the sense of ownership comes from experiencing and of being immersed. So that when recently the garden was threatened by development, we asked, we called together that community and had a party. It was a rally, really, but we called it a party so the local community wouldn't get worried, uh, the local authority wouldn't get worried. Um, and we asked, what is the currency of value? And this was the currency of value. It was biodiversity, care, the community, the sense of enclosure, the fact it was free, the sense of well-being, the extension of your home, because a lot of people in this area live in flats, so they don't have gardens. It was that there was places to play. Kids could muck about in the soil. It was tranquil. And that we put to the local authority to support its retention. Um, and, it was also, and, and, and it was about, mostly, about well-being, about a deep-seated attachment. Um, and we've been doing some research with King's College London and an artist collective called Nomad to actually 
capture this um, through an app that we're developing, which asks about how you feel and where you are. That's a whole other lecture. Um, but the fact is that this is, we, we have evidence. So this app is to create evidence to influence policy. But this is um, a cue to get into the garden in October last year. And they're not coming here to see Tracy Emin. They're coming here to see the pumpkin carving. Um, so, through our social enterprise, um, we're focused uh, by that passion and desire to explore the delicate balance of nature, the nature of nature in the city, to get out into the field, whether that's that field is formal, natural, incidental, um, because the ideal, in my view, is not a product, but it's a, it's a process, and it's never complete. It's about sharing knowledge, creating opportunities through design for all of us to understand our place, our potential, our impact, and our ability to appreciate and to commit to be part of an environmental movement which is not exclusive, but which regards human life as just one of many equal components of a global system, a deep ecology of ecological and cultural diversity. Thank you. <laughs>